audience, welcome to the last interview of Room for Discussion for this academic year. Today we'll be interviewing the first female executive director of the European Law Enforcement Agency, Catherine de Bolle. After finishing her Masters of Law, working at the Gendarmerie and Interpol, she has now been appointed her second term as executive director for Europol. Um, today we'll be talking about how crime has changed uh, in the almost 30 years of experience that Ms. de Bolle has had in the field. Um, and how these changes have affected Europol's responsibilities and how they reflect um, on the recent uh, reforms that have been made to Europol's mandate. Uh, so if you're in interested in crime and digitalization, please take a seat and give a warm welcome to Ms. de Bolle. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Ms. De Valle, first of all, congratulations on your appointment to your second term. Um, Must be really exciting. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, we would like to start off with yeah. asking you what it is to be like a real life M from the James Bond movies. <laughs> what does your, your average day look like? First of all, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> of course. And, um, uh, for this opportunity you give me today. To be the life M uh, for uh, law enforcement is great, of course. It was my dream from a child already to become a police woman. It's uh, 30 years ago now uh, that I, I, I took my first steps. Um, I was a bit too uh, small to become a police, so I studied law, and then afterwards I could join the gendarmerie. And for me, uh, the important thing was to do the right thing and to help people finding solutions for their problems. And really to contribute in an operational way um, to society, to make sure that what we have, we will not lose it, and to protect. The first aim for me was to protect children. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it still is high on the agenda uh, of the European Union also today. And I must say I'm very grateful to my country and to my colleagues and to my parents and my, my family uh, to give me the opportunity to do what I, what I did until now. Because uh, when you start with a job as a policewoman, you have to be available. Yeah. And, and problems occur all the time, so you, you have to be there when that society needs you. That was my biggest motivation in back to become a policewoman. And on that note, you've mentioned that being a woman, um, it was different for you. But you've had a very long and successful career in law enforcement. Um, did you find it difficult to sort of break the glass ceiling in a very male-dominated yeah. area? Uh, when I started in the police in Belgium, we were two women. Oh, wow. All the rest wow. were men. Um, but I must say, I never felt discriminated. I never felt mistreated. I felt that the uh, people uh, respected me for who I, whom I was. Yeah. And um, the, what, the only thing I needed to do to uh, grow in the position is that um, you always need to be well prepared. And I always needed to know a bit more than the others because I was <laughs> yeah. the only woman around the table. So if I made a mistake, everybody would remember the mistakes. And when you have 30 men and one woman, nobody would remember the, the mistakes made by men, but yes, by women they did, because I was the only one. But that is the only thing I see. I, I was uh, really supported by a few males who really believed in the added value of women in police forces and justice authorities uh, globally. And, and um, yes, you, when something is not right or, or something does not go well, you have to dare to say so. And also, I think you have to recognize and to be well aware of your limits, your own limits. And um, you have to study your whole life. Yeah. You cannot stop. And for me, it's, it's very important. My, my, my main thing, as I said, is to serve society, to do the right thing. And if you stick to do your uh, perspective and to your initial goal, then you can grow a lot. And in our societies in the European Union, there are a lot of opportunities. You just have to take them when they uh, when they pass by, but you don't have it for granted. You have to work for it. That is that is that is sure. 
And have you seen any any changes in the makeup of law enforcement over the almost 30 years yeah. you've been in the field? I have seen a lot of changes. Um, uh, I see that there are a lot of women now mm -hmm. working in police forces, with, which is good, all over Europe. Um, in the beginning, when I started uh, 30 years ago, it was a locally organized police work. You looked at your region, you looked national national uh, uh, focus was already important. Now you really have this global focus because of the digitalization and the, um, the crime uh, is organizing, crime organizations are organizing themselves globally, so that, that made a big change. Um, in the past you had uh, the paper world, the yeah. physical world, now you have all the data coming in, you have um, the internet, you have social media, so the exposure is bigger and the globalization is bigger and that is the biggest issue. And as a police force, we also have to adapt ourselves and to change constantly and to adapt to, um, to the new developments in the world, the new opportunities. For us, it's very important when, when we look, for instance, uh, to technology, to make the assessment, what is in for us, for the police force, and what is in for criminals, and how do we have to address this, what solutions do we have to invent. So creativity is very important in police, that is also why in the past um, you had more and more people coming from military schools with a law degree, now in police forces we hire all the degrees. Yeah. because diversity makes the organization stronger. People with a history background, for instance, they know what happened in the past and it's very good to understand better and to reflect on the future. So the combination of the diversity is extremely important uh, in a police force. Okay. And the Europol is, um, apart from being a law enforcement agency, it's also very focused on cooperation with um, local police forces, but also other uh, agencies. Um, but the agency doesn't have direct power to arrest suspects without mm -hmm. cooperation with um, state police offices. So would you say that, uh, that arresting criminals is not your main mandate? Uh, yes, it is. Europol was uh, uh, established 22, three, 23 years ago. And it was a clear need from police forces in the European Union to work together and to share information already then without all this um, uh, internet environment. Uh, because to tackle crime, you need to cooperate and you, you need to exchange information. So the most important uh, reason to exist for Europol is to be a platform of information exchange relevant for policing. And uh, police forces, they wanted to, uh, to work together related to terrorism and to related, related to serious and organized crime. Because these are the two areas which are important for international police cooperation and cross-border policing. And um, we see that this is still in the essence of Europol, information exchange um, and cross-border crime. And um, so that is, uh, that is the reason why we do not have executive powers, because it's a matter of national sovereignty. It's also foreseen in the Lisbon Treaty, concretely, that Europol does not have, uh, national, that does not have executive powers. It remains in the hands of uh, the national member states. And I believe this is the good thing. Because working together, you cannot oblige people to work together. They, they have to want and they, they need to see the need to work together. And our aim is to add value to what they do. We process data, we receive data, we process the data, we come to investigative leads, leads. These leads go back to member states and they use them in their cases to bring perpetrators before court. That is essentially what we do. We also coordinate a lot in between the different law enforcement agencies. But it's also, it's always the police force on national level who will decide what we can do. We will not oblige them anything. They choose to work with us. More and more they share data with us. We coordinate, we collect the data. We connect the data between the different countries, we coordinate and we create new data in fact, and the new data are the new investigative leads they need. So, so the Europol's main office then looks a little bit more like a tech company than a, than a police office maybe? Yes, you can, you can say it like that, but now with the Ukrainian crisis for instance, we deploy also police officers from Europol because 
the people working in Europol or most of the time police officers. Wow. We deploy police officers to the border countries mm -hmm. uh, to make, uh, when it's needed and asked for by the national authorities, secondary security checks to have a good view of who is coming in into the European Union and who poses a threat to the European Union. So do they do more data gathering at the borders or do they actually also actively um, pursue police work at the borders? Of Europe? Uh, we support more and more the police forces on the ground. Okay. Yeah. So they're yeah. not sent as missionaries, but they're sort of there to support the local police forces as well? Yes, it's the local police forces, the national police forces, they are responsible mm -hmm. for the work they do. And when they see, uh, through risk indicators, a risk, they come to us and they ask us to check uh, the people that are crossing the border. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we signed up for the newsletter of your report, <laughs> and we see um, a lot of what you publicly put out into the world are, are these kind of smaller, more niche busts that have to do with, for example, um, to name an example, confiscating counterfeit cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Why why do you um, decide to publicly kind of... Um we want to be a transparent organization and we believe informing the public is important because it's, you need to know what is going on in the continent you live in and in the European Union. It's also creating awareness. Everybody is on the internet. Everybody is on social media. You also have to understand um, the, uh, the challenges you, you will have to deal with and the threats uh, posing, uh, posed by this, uh, by this digital world, in fact. But these, these um, push messages that we were getting yeah. seemed quite small scale for, for an organization that works so internationally within the EU. <laughs> Are there these busts that you might not publicize for certain reasons? Or uh, Yes, we decide on what we publish and what we want, because we also, uh, the confidence and the trust from law enforcement is very important and mm. one of the big principles of Europol is that the member state decides what we do with the data. So they decide you can cross-check the data, you can share the data, you can't share the data and um, uh, it's, it's up to a member state what we can do with the data. We are the data broker but we do not, we are, we do not own the data. Is it a difficult balance between being a transparent organization and you having to keep in line with the member states? No, because the overall crime threats, that is something we can share. Yeah. But also, with the, always with the consent of member states, because if you refer to examples, it's uh, sometimes easy to identify uh, which country is involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But there is a big understanding on European level in between the police community and also customs is involved. Um, uh, what we can share and what we can't share. So personal operational data, you don't share that. But you can share the threats to create awareness and to make people aware and also political decision makers aware of the threats the European Union is confronted with. Okay. And um, sort of moving on to another uh, aspect of Europe. Well, Europe has changed quite a bit in the past decade. Um, especially in the last few years, you've added uh, other sections to it, um, like the European Cyber Crime Center and the EU Internet Referral Unit. Um, how has crime changed in an era of digitalization in your experience? Um, yeah, it, it is a big change. Uh, it has been a big change also for, uh, for the law enforcement community. Um, we try to uh, be a bit proactive um, to, towards crime uh, of the future um, and indeed when we see the need to create or to be very clear about the tools we offer to member states we work with the center approach because then it's for a member state very clear in that crime area we, fi we find those tools and they uh, are at our disposal in that area uh, of the organization so um, we have for instance uh, specialists in cryptocurrencies Mm -hmm. um, we, we have now a special program related uh, to the uh, Cybercrime Center on ransomware because that is a big threat, it's increasing all the time. Uh, we need to have a good view and also pretty, uh, an approach uh, from police perspective towards that. Uh, last year, in 2020, we launched uh, the Economic and Financial Crime Center because also during pandemic we saw uh, it's all about money. So we have to focus on the money when we, it's not about arrests, it's, it's, it's also about arrests, <laughs> but for us it's, it's a lot about money, where are the money flows going to, where are they coming from, 
where are the beneficial owners, uh, how do we pre protect, in fact, uh, the money in the countries and, and the rule of law, and how do we prevent infiltration of illegal money in the legal economy, mm -hmm. because that is what we discovered is a big issue at the moment. The uh, crime organizations that we know about, 80% of them use the legal, in, the legal economy to launder their money. And that is a big issue, that's a big threat, a big threat for the legal economy. And these changes, have they, um, in, the, in money laundering and uh, money selling, have it, has it changed the way you monitor money in, in Europe and flows of money? Yes, I think um, we had, um, uh, we know that criminals, they misuse encrypted uh, communication possibilities. Um, and we had some cases, big cases together with member states and also with other continents and, and with the help of the FBI and the EA and, and, and all these people, uh, we were able, uh, under the judicial oversight, to get insights in the encrypted communication and that was really a world opening themselves for us. So as law enforcement community, we were not completely aware about the streams, the money streams and the, the way of working of criminal organizations until a year or a year and a half ago. So when, um, when we discovered that, then we adapt and we change our organization and we look for new approaches, how to approach those new, new threats in fact. Yeah. Was it not quite late for you to only um, figure this, these money streams out uh, a year ago? It's, uh, you, you, you always um, uh, have to assess the possibilities you have on a legal basis, yeah. you have data protection, you have technological developments and possibilities in the organizations, and then uh, we, what we saw is that um, a lot of criminals and the demand for encrypted tools and encrypted communication networks were growing. So in some member states, they launched investigations and then that is the, the platform approach from Europol. You come then together with different countries, you assess the situation and if you see that in different countries you are confronted with the same issues and you launch investigations in the same areas, then there is a coordination at Europol as a platform approach and you, you go together um, uh, in this endeavor. And then when you have the judicial oversight and the possibilities and you can decrypt uh, uh, communication um, uh, channels, then you find out a lot because mm, yeah. these criminals, they were so sure that nobody could read or see <laughs> what, they, they, what the messages were about. So it was a, a box opening for us and it gave us a lot of new insights. So kind of you touched upon it already a little bit with uh, privacy legislation in the EU. It feels like a lot of these new digital ways of, um, of doing crimes, um, the legislative power in the EU is kind of walking behind that and, and there's still a lack of legislation around, for example, cryptocurrencies, but also privacy and data gathering. How does it affect the work at Europol? It has always been like that. Criminals always look for possibilities offered by law, by gaps in the law, by gaps in coordination, by gaps in communication in between different services. They all always look for the, the, um, uh, their possibilities and opportunities. Okay. So they are very flexible and they are very agile. They also work with their specialists to look for those gaps. And um, yeah, then they make use of them to organize their criminal business. And for us it's key to detect also those gaps that may be used by criminals and to try to find creative solutions. And uh, we have to work with the legal frameworks we have, but the uh, it, uh, police work shows also that the legal opportunities for us are also there. And um, uh, at Europol we work under judicial oversight, so you have prosecutors involved, you have uh, instructive judges involved, so you have your legal assessments and then you know how far you can go. But it's true, um, we are still uh, looking for the perfect balance between privacy and internal security, but I really believe that in the long run in, we will find the right balance. Um, and, in, and in fact, in a lot of member states, a lot of judges and police officers are looking to the solutions that are offered already by law at, at this moment. And, and they apply them. 
do you think that with the expansion of your poll um, that has been happening uh, over the years, you're kind of closing that gap or trying to close that gap? Yes, uh, it's foreseen in our legislation that every five years mm -hmm. we have an uh, evaluation of our legal framework done by the Commission mm. to see that we are still future proof mm -hmm. and that we can fulfill our mission support member states in serious and organized crime and terrorism threats. Uh, against serious and organized crime and terrorism mm -hmm. threats. And um, in fact, the legal framework, the new one we will have, will give us the necessary clarification on the processing of the big data sets. I saw when I uh, started at Europol in 2019 that uh, the large amounts of data and complex data and to process all this data was really an issue for us. And we needed clarification uh, by law. Yeah. And uh, I approached the European Data Protection Supervisor to, to help us to interpret law, but we, the Commission uh, was convinced that uh, clarification by law was needed, and that is why we have an updated legal framework. And in five years it will be evaluated again to see uh, is it still future-proof, do we have to adjust uh, something or not. So it's uh, the changes are really uh, taking on board the fact that for the law enforcement community you need to be able to invest in research and innovation, mm. you need to be able to process large data sets and also co cooperation with private sector has yeah. to be recognized because they have the mass of data, the yeah. private sector. They have more than law enforcement than justice, <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. So you're not the, the only organ of the EU, of course, and um, maybe some of these mandates between the different organs of the EU actually overlap. So we were wondering, for example, with money laundering that you touched upon, are there places where your mandate doesn't reach and the ECB, for example, takes over? Um, we have, uh, I think it was adopted yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. the money laundering uh, directive. Um, we have a, there are a lot of uh, agencies and uh, possibilities on European level um, and we try to cooperate with everybody. So for instance with OLAF, we have a liaison officer from OLAF in-house. We make joint analysis and we do this also with the drugs agency for instance. When we have sister agencies, we always try to find a way how can we strengthen one, in one another and how can we exchange information with one another. And most of the time, sometimes you can have overlaps, but most of the times uh, you have the possibility to collaborate and to, um, uh, to, dis to make a, a clear distinction about uh, the different uh, possibilities. Um, you kind of touched upon the drug industry. Um, and we are in the Netherlands where there are a lot of courts and export and import. Um, and so the drug industry continues to be very expansive, but in your almost 30 years working in law enforcement, did you see any um, change in trafficking networks? Do you see that that's sort of evolving as well? Uh, yes. Um, when I started 30 years ago, the abuse, drugs abuse was rather, it, it was not so common as it, as it is today. And um, uh, what we see now is that um, the criminal organizations, we know 40% of them are active in drugs because it's a very lucrative business. Mm -hmm. We see the big change uh, with the production in Colombia. 60% of the drugs producted, production over there is coming to the EU mm -hmm. and not anymore to the US. So the EU is more important for those um, producers uh, than the US as the, at this moment. Um, and we see, in fact, indeed, uh, the three important harbors uh, in the Union are Rotterdam, uh, Rotterdam, yes, um, Antwerp and Hamburg. Mm. But we see also that smaller harbors are used uh, for drugs. But it makes sense that when you have huge flows of containers, you also have the volumes they follow one another because the risk of detection is a bit less it's it's difficult to detect everything what is important now is that each country in the european union considers the fight against drugs abuse as a priority mm -hmm. and uh, each country in the european union contributes to europol in the drugs fusion center 
and each country recognizes that financial investigations linked to drugs investigations are extremely important. Mm -hmm. We have to go and to follow the money and we have to make sure that we can seize the money so that the drugs kingpins uh, lose a lot. And what we also see is that um, different than before is that the kingpins, they are not in the European Union. Those, the, the CEOs from the drugs cartels, they are not in the European Union, they are outside of the European Union, in, in continents where they feel a bit safer, mm. where they have log logistics uh, next to them. Um, so they are not physically in contact with the executors. But then we are in the Netherlands, which I think is estimated to have the biggest export production of uh, MDMA and XTC. What about export from the EU to different countries? Yeah, we are source country for men, uh, amphetamines. Mm -hmm. We are uh, transit uh, for cocaine and cannabis. Uh, and we are producer also for cannabis. So <laughs> we do have we everything. Have, everything. <laughs> we have a very good infrastructure in the EU. We yeah. have very we have a very good economy, our standards of life are very high, so we are uh, very interesting for criminal organizations, not only for drugs, but also for other areas, for fraud schemes, mm -hmm. for uh, trafficking in human beings, exploitation. We, we are, yeah, we are rich. Mm. So where do you get your money? You get your money in the continents where rich people are. And yeah. has the internet had an impact on, on those trade markets? Whether well, drug trade or... Yes, yeah, so of course, it yeah. facilitates uh, their life a bit. Eh? They, mm. they are more global. They have the... The, the art, outreach is, uh, is bigger. What's the strangest use of the internet in the drug trafficking industry you've seen? The, um, the communication possibilities. Yeah. The yeah. encrypted messages. Yes, yeah, yeah. that is the biggest uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to move on to, um, to another section now. Um, Europe has uh, gotten a huge increase in its mandate, uh, considering its ability to gather data recently. And could you maybe explain a bit what those um, changes are and what it means to your operation? Uh, yes, it, uh, the, the legal framework now is making it clear when we receive data, uh, we have to make the distinction, do we have data related to an investigation or is it data non-related to an investigation? And then the new legal framework foresees different periods to store the data in our databases. That's in fact the big, the big thing that has changed. So, so that we are sure that people who, are, who have nothing to do with the crime, that we filter them out as soon as possible, and people responsible for crimes, that they can stay in when we need them uh, to investigate. So in fact, it's, you have to see it, you collect the data and we only want the relevant data. So we need to process it to filter it out and to only keep the relevant data in our databases and to minimize the risk for the people who have nothing to do with the crime. Mm -hmm. However, you've also um, gained the ability to buy data from private parties like telecom companies, right? Excuse um, me. You've also you've also have have the ability to now buy data from we don't buy private data. parties. <laughs> no, you don't. We receive data from the justice authorities and the police okay. authorities in the member states, and we help them in processing the data. Okay. Yeah. But in your new mandate, we already touched upon it a little yeah. bit. You said that private um, companies are a big actor in kind of yes. uh, gathering this data. Yeah. The big difference with the past, with 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 the actual situation, will be that when we, uh, now we will be able to receive data from private companies and to mm -hmm. process this data. Because before we could receive data, mm -hmm. but immediately we had to send this data to the relevant member state. Mm, okay. And when we didn't find, we could not accept uh, the data. So now we will receive the data. We still have to make the assessment to define the relevant country. But in the meantime, we will be able to process the data already. And how will you gain access to the data of private companies? Do they just the, like like uh, yeah, you, you, it's it's a kind of processing? Eh? Okay. Yeah. They just give it to you. Yeah. It depends. It, it's it's uh, in a criminal investigation. It goes with just uh, judicial oversight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But for instance, um, we can receive data from NGOs. We mm -hmm. had this with the terrorist uh, situation in 2016 
when NGOs were active in Syria, there was a lot of uh, data they gathered. They didn't know what to do with it. They come to us and then we filter the data out to see are there links with criminal, with terrorist investigations that are ongoing on European soil in European countries. But there, there is a big difference between gathering data from law enforcement agencies that is targeted at criminals mm -hmm. as opposed to getting data from telecom providers, yes. right? Yes. Isn't there a huge privacy concern? Yes, of course, and that is why the privacy uh, safeguards in the new legal framework are, are very, very good, because you need to have the balance. Uh, how far can you go with um, uh, private uh, cooperation? Yeah. It's, it's since the start of Europol, it was a big concern from member states and also from the European level that um, the safeguards uh, related to data protection are mm -hmm. taken on board. So we have always had a strong data protection supervision. We have an internal data protection officer. We have now the European data protection supervisor and you, had also, you have also this board from data protection officers from the member states and in fact I would not say, in some cases they decide, in some cases they give advice, but they have a big role in how we have to process the data. So a lot of people are involved in ensuring Safety. that privacy is being... In scrutiny, in fact, yeah. 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 We've yeah. seen, I think, uh, in the past, with the adoption of, of data sets and algorithm, a lot of criticism towards um, how software can sometimes um, unjustifiably target a marginalized group or stereotypes. Has Europol taken any, any action in, in increasing this data and mandate to counter that? Um, internally, you mean by, uh, for the processing of the data we receive? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we have, as I said, the data protection officer mm -hmm. is involved in all the developments of the processes. And then we have the data protection supervisor who's also involved in, um, in, in how the way we process uh, data. Um, and then you have uh, strong procedures. When you start with an operation, uh, operating model, you have the data impact uh, assessment you have to make for all the cases uh, to assess what is the risk, in fact, for a citizen. And uh, before, you, um, before you start with the processing of the data. And of course, for us, we work on ongoing cases in the member states. So when data is coming to us, in fact, it's most of the time linked to an investigation in a member state or two member states. So you have already the justice, uh, the judicial oversight, a decision of a judge to work on that case and uh, which information is relevant for the case before it comes to us. So it's a, a, uh, you are in a very well protected area. Okay, so it's already processed a little bit when it comes to you, the data. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, there, is there has already been done an evaluation on national mm -hmm. level. Uh, because we talk about serious and organized crime and terrorism, these are the very complex investigations. Mm -hmm. So in member states, normally the judges, the prosecutors are already involved. So you have already your first analysis on national level. Then you need two countries because uh, for serious and organized crime, you can only come to Europol when two countries are involved in that case, then they come to us and then uh, we start with the analyzing uh, of, of, um, yeah, of, of the whole thing. Do you ever check this data that comes from, from member states? Do you check if it's not uh, using maybe stereotype typical uh, software or? We are not uh, the controller mm. of the national authorities, that's yeah. up to the judges. They but have to be the guarantee for the, the integrity, in fact, of the investigation and but then the, the instructive judges. You wouldn't want to, to marginalize your EU citizens with, with the data processing that you're doing as an EU agency, right? Yeah, but I see, as I said, you have the data protection officer who's looking at all the processes and also tools. You have the data protection supervisor looking at the processes and the tools. We have our own data protection impact assessment. Then you have um, the uh, um, joint uh, board of data protection officers. And we have now 10% of our staff is working on data protection in the office. So uh, there are a lot of safeguards in place. The framework is, uh, 
is really uh, strong. Mm. We have one of the uh, most uh, important uh, data protection uh, legislation in, in the whole world as a police office. It has been impl it has been growing with the time since the start until now. It has been a growing process. Everybody is aware of that. And um, when when we receive data from member states, we do not scrutinize uh, the European Union member states because they had a whole process to become member of the European Union. Also, their justice systems and their police systems has been evaluated. Uh, we are not in a position at Europol to, to, to question that. Uh, it's mm -hmm. about European yeah. values, it's about rule of law, and all the members of the European Union are at the same level and should have the same standards for police cooperation. Mm -hmm. If there are difficulties, it has to be um, uh, addressed and assessed by the national parliaments, by the European parliaments, and uh, by inspection services that exist in the different countries. Mm -hmm. And most of all, the big guarantee for the police investigations or the justice authorities who are involved in the cases and who are independent from police and from political level. Has Europol ever tipped off the EU Parliament um, of a member state that doesn't really align with these European values on corruption or, or data gathering? Either? We have a lot of um, uh, sessions with the European Parliament also with the Joint Parliamentary Scrutiny Group, that is a, a group of national parliamentarians with European parliamentarians. They ask us a lot of questions, we provide them with the answers, uh, and they make their assessment. On um, if, if member states... That it's up to the, the political world. level. We give inf the information we have, as far as we can, mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, because also when you have a, a judicial case, sometimes it's under embargo and the justice authorities have to decide if you can disclose something or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, the information is handled by the member states, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, we give the information we can give, mm -hmm. and then in the European Parliament they make the assessment. Okay. And uh, with these new monitoring rules that you've uh, installed, there's a higher, there are higher information flows between member countries within the EU and a general growing access for in, to, like, to information in the EU. Why is this necessary? Why increase flows of information between countries? Um, I think because crime is becoming more global. Yeah. Because if you see that the, the problems you are con what is local is international and what is international has local impact. So the connection between the two is, is really there. And uh, in serious and organized crime and terrorism, member states, they see that they cannot solve the issue alone anymore. And, and everything related to that area is cross-border. So that is why they really need to cooperate, to exchange information with themselves, because otherwise they will lose uh, uh, their, um, their possibility to, to keep to respect, to continue to respect the rule of, of law and to enforce the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Do you see any danger in an increase in information flows and a faster pace of information flows? In yeah, you have to be able to process it. Yeah. 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 You have. You need to have the tools. Uh, you need uh, to be able to implement the tools to process the data mm -hmm. on a short notice. Because you cannot afford yourself to have too much information that is not uh, processed in your databases. And do you think Europol has enough time for that? Because there's a very short period of time, right, to process we data. We prioritize. Now. Yeah. We prioritize, yes. Yeah. Um, there's been a, a call to suspend Russia from access to the Interpol database. We talked about this a little bit before with you. Um, how is Europol dealing with potential misuses of uh, data by, for example, more authoritarian EU member states? Um, we have uh, the system in place that we have operational agreements with third countries and that is a process that is managed by the European Commission mm. um, and there the data protection standards and privacy standards are key and so we can only exchange data with third countries when there is an operational agreement in place otherwise it's not possible and we, with Russia we do not have an operational agreement. But for example Hungary has been becoming increasingly more authoritarian and there are some kind of concerns from, from EU citizens saying, well, if Hungary gets access to this huge, 
Europol database. It might use it to um, prosecute political opponents. We are a technical agency, we are a police agency, we cooperate with police forces when there are other issues that need to be discussed in other fora. We are a police service. How is the procedure, um, what's the procedure like for EU member states to receive data from Europol? Um, as I said, each member state is owner of its own data. Mm -hmm. So if the Netherlands, they want to receive uh, data uh, from Germany that is stored in Europol, or they want to know is there a link with, uh, if the Dutch, they send information to Europol, and they want to know if there is a link with another country, mm -hmm. then we have to ask, Europol has to ask that other country, can we share this with the Netherlands or not? And if that country says no, then it's no. What if there's a, what if you have a suspicion of a group or an individual um, and they go to another country in, in Europe? Will you, is it Europol's role to inform um, the local police agencies of that? Of, of such a group happening, of crime activity being moved? Um, what, we do, what we do is when we have intelligence, for instance, of um, moving targets, mm -hmm. we always go back to the source country, we ask can we share it, and okay. if they agree to share it, then we share it. Okay. Yeah. Do you get a lot of instances of countries saying no to sharing the data? No. There is a lot of trust in between the European member states. But, but, but they, yeah, they keep um, this uh, standard relatively high because they also want to know who will have their data. They, they need to know that also for their intelligence uh, picture. Okay, so this is something that really, it's, there's not too many, you don't see a danger in sharing information between your members. It's a case-by-case -case evaluation. Okay. But there is a lot of trust in between member states. I think it would be interesting to also touch upon a little bit um, the war in Ukraine, like we did a little bit before. Mm -hmm. um, Europol has some concerns about weaponry um, that is going into Ukraine now, and yeah. that might get into the hands of criminal gangs. Can yeah. you explain a little bit more about that? Yes, we have different areas we follow up and we monitor from Europol perspective. Um, and we do this together with the Ukrainian liaison officer in our headquarters because with Ukraine we have an operational agreement already from 2017. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when the war started, we evaluated together with the member states what are the threats we see. Of course, what we saw is trafficking in human beings, mm -hmm. migrant smuggling, because criminal groups, they see a lot of people coming in, uh, women and children, vulnerable groups. Will they? try to get money out of that or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that was the first thing we did. Then also, will it have an impact on um, the, um, uh, the displacement of organized crime groups? Will they come more to the European Union or will they stay over there? That is something we monitor. And then of course, uh, also the uh, armed trafficking. Uh, now we see that a lot of uh, arms um, will be in Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, after the war. Yeah, we yeah. have to be aware of the risks uh, posed by that. We have to, to, to know a bit where their arms will be and if they will be in the hands of criminal uh, organizations or not. And in terms of the, the refugee situation that we're seeing, do you see any parallels to the 2016 Syrian refugee crisis? No. 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 And is there any, um, pr like, are there procedures that you've sort of installed now yeah. To, uh, that are similar to that, or, or yes. is it a completely different situation? Yes, we support uh, the member states, the border countries. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, people from Europol deployed over there yeah. to do secondary security checks. And um, um, what we see is that, that in the first waves, a lot of people coming to the European Union, they joined their family that was already in the European Union. So that was already a big difference. And I must say that um, we learned a lot of lessons out of uh, the 2016 mm. uh, crisis mm -hmm. that uh, member states are more prepared how to deal with uh, the streams. Yeah. And there have been far, far less, for example, human trafficking in this crisis? Than no, before, not right? so many cases yeah. detected until now. And do you cooperate with Frontex? With, with yes, yeah. yes. 
uh, Frontex, they have their police office, their officers, border, border guards uh, at the frontier. Mm -hmm. And we have our, uh, you, most of the time, our people are in the headquarters yeah. and the Frontex officers are at the border. Okay. Yeah. I think um, it's time for us to give the audience a chance <laughs> to ask you some very interesting questions. So are there any people in our audience that want to ask you? Uh, the girl in the white on the front? Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, thank you so much. Um, I, earlier you said that a priority for you has been children. I'm currently writing my thesis on international parental child abductions and the flaws within the corresponding 1980 hate convention. Um, what role do you think Europol has played and can play to prevent international parental child abductions from A, happening in the first place, and to support law enforcement and arrests of abducting parents? We do not uh, come in between so much in the investigations because uh, most of the time it's only one country that is involved and uh, because you have the parents living in a country and not a second uh, country. So we are very much supporting member states in child sexual abuse cases, but in parental, uh, no, not so. We, we, are, we only interfere when we are asked by the national authorities to support them and they need two countries so in these cases we are not much uh, solicited any other questions <laughs> boy in the white <laughs> yeah hi uh, thank you my name is Ava. well first of all thank you for being here i think it's been really interesting um, I would like to bring it back uh, to Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, you've touched upon the, the weapon deliveries. And when you make these uh, public statements saying that you're worried about uh, weapons handing up in the, well, the wrong hands, um, are you not worried about the implications of such a statement? Because I think if a respected authority, such as Europol states, were worried about delivering weapons, do you not think this could shift public opinion within Europe against uh, providing weapons to Ukraine? It's uh, one of our uh, core missions uh, to make uh, the threat assessment and the risk assessment. And so if we assess the risks, we have to uh, talk about the possible risks we see. It's also consolidated with the member states. Yes. To maybe argue against it, um, if we do not um, provide Ukraine with enough weapons, I think the risk is bigger than the risk that is uh, currently there of the weapons yeah. ending, up in, uh, ending up in the wrong hands. Yes, but we are confronted still today with, after 30 years, with uh, the big um, uh, problems we had after the, the Balkan War with the weapons. So it's a national, uh, it's, it's very good that the, the European uh, member states support Ukraine but we have to be to look a bit further because we know now already that criminal organizations will misuse this so we have to be aware of risks for the future to protect our rule of law and to make sure that we have that we reflect already on answers okay let's do one last one question. question um a girl in pink Yes, hi. Um, then maybe as a last question, I'd be interested to know where you think Europol is kind of going in the future. Sometimes we hear about a European police force and sort of more cooperation amongst, especially intelligence sharing. Or do you think that national sovereignty will always sort of trump um, cooperation amongst member states? I think it's very important that you keep that national sovereignty is there. And uh, because you have the direct accountability towards the, the people in your country. So Europol offers uh, European policing solutions, offers a platform for cooperation, offers a lot of uh, digital tools, forensic tools to support uh, member states in the investigations. But I think it's uh, the way the system has been developed until now is a good system. So no European police force, like a European army of the United Nations? We are not a federal state. Europe is not a federal state, so it's already different from the start. So uh, I really believe, uh, and I have seen the two sides, 
I really believe in the system as it is today. It's also a strength of Europol. Every day we have to prove that we can offer something. If we do not do that, then people will not come, uh, law enforcement authorities will not come to us anymore. Then we will not be relevant. It's too easy to think that with orders and with obligations, you will uh, enhance police work. I don't believe in it. Okay. So I think we want to, we want to ask you one last fun question. Um, so we've discussed what Europe was going to do in the near future and your new mandate and, and changes that are happening. But we were very curious as to which most wanted criminal would you most like to arrest with those new tools that you have in your hand? <laughs> I cannot answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is there any particular area of crime that you're particularly like, talking Yeah, for me it's uh, child it sexual abuse online. Yeah. It is completely unacceptable. We yeah. cannot uh, deal with all the uh, images and videos that are on yeah. online. Uh, the abuse of the encrypted communication is for me a scandal. Uh, this needs to be addressed and I don't uh, want to live in a European Union where we do not have the, the appropriate answer to that. Mm -hmm. So we, we really have to uh, enhance the fight against uh, child sexual abuse online because it, it, uh, it stigmatizes uh, people for the rest of their lives and, and uh, the number of uh, images and pictures uh, online uh, and that stay online are, are unacceptable. They are on an, at, at an unacceptable level. So for me, this is the biggest. Uh, it's really a threat uh, to the to the society, and uh, it's about uh, children everywhere in the world. So uh, if you cannot protect your children, or if you don't want to protect your children, or, or if you think you do not need to have solutions for that, then I have a big uh, problem with that. So yeah. from a police perspective, we do whatever we can can within the legal frameworks, uh, but the abuse of, uh, of the communication possibilities uh, for these uh, people abusing children online, it's uh, unacceptable. Okay. Let's hope that these new tools will give you the power yeah. to kind of change this narrative. <laughs> yeah. um, Mr. Bullet, thank you so, so much for your time and your very interesting answers. And for our audience, again, thank you so much for your interest in our discussions. Over summer, we'll have a little summer stuff, but you can still check out all our interviews on Spotify and YouTube, so please do so. And one big applause for Ms. Katrina de Bolle. Thank you.